What's up, YouTube family? Welcome to the Linked Up Church online experience. We're so glad that you've chosen to connect with us today. Before we jump into the message, we wanted to let you know that we have a ton of great content for the whole family. We have great videos for your small children in the Little Linkland section, for your kids in the Linked Up Kids section, and relevant services for your teenagers from the plug. We'd love to be a blessing to your whole family, so check out these videos when you can. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you never miss a video from us. Now, let's get started. Well, the Right Reverend and I, we are going to be talking to you about relationships. And in that relationship, the title of this message is simply called Folks. Folks. You folks, us folks, our folks. Folks. What is that? Our friends and family? Ordinary people? Loved ones, you know, the one you're dating, you're engaged to, our kids and our spouses, F-O-L-K-S. Now, whether it's your neighbors, your co-workers, social groups, fraternities, sororities, co-workers, bosses, neighbors, again, neighbors, praise the Lord, we all have to deal with people, right? God called us to live in community. He programmed us to need people in our lives. I don't care how much of a loner you say you are. There are times where you get sick and tired of being by yourself. Can I have anyone that's going to be honest with me up here? Right? And so then with that being said, let's talk about relationships. What is the definition of relationships? Because we make it a little bit too deep. Sometimes we do. Google Dictionary. I went to the cur most current thing that's out there because we <laughs> quick to Google. Google Dictionary says that relationship is the way in which two or more concepts, objects, or people are connected or the state of being connected. The way in which two or more people or groups regard and behave towards one another. That's, good. that's the simple definition of relationships. It's how in our context, two or more people or groups of people relate and connect to one another. So you don't necessarily have to know their name to be in some kind of relationship with them. Okay. Right now, the person you are sitting next to, you are in relationship with them. And you have met, probably, there I go. You may have never seen them before in your life. But for the next 60 to 75 minutes, they impact your presence. Especially if you came here with them. Or if you leave here with them, right? So let me help you understand it this way. A lot of people have, you know, there's, there's this, there has been this epidemic of a fatherless generation. And so many of people... If you never knew your father, you don't know your father, and your father don't really know you. Okay, so there's no relationship there, right? The only relationship that is there is genetics. But as far as the social context, there's no real relationship there. But if you know who your father is, and your father know who you are, though you may not have seen each other, there's a relationship. It's broken. It may be severed. But there's a relationship there. My mom, before I, she passed, she got into a big fight. I was there. We were in Korea on the highway. And they get into this big fight in Korean. And all my father said was they are cussing at each other right now. <laughs> it was her sister and her brother, right? Get into this big fight on the highway. So imagine you are on 285. It is crowded. Very little shoulder space. My uncle pulls over the truck the van with us in it gets out and starts walking down the highway and tells them to figure out, tells us to figure out how to get home. And for, for till the day that she died, for over nine years, they had not spoken. Now, they were still in a relationship, but they were just mad at each other, not talking, right? So, if that's, if, if, if you're, whether you're close or whether you're apart, not talking, you are still in relationship with people. I want you to get that in your head because we think that relationship only means things that are positive or good. 
But we're going to talk about how to deal with not just the positive and good, but also the neutral and maybe not so good. That's good. Excellent. All right. So relationships can enormously, enormously be satisfying and they're designed to ultimately reflect our relationship with God. So I want you to think about relationships this way. The relationships that we have horizontally reflect the relationship that we have vertically. Can you all see that? And so really the better my relationship is with God, the better my relationship can be with other people. And I'll explain that further uh, in a moment. When, when sin entered the world, then it broke our relationship with God, right? And then it also broke our relationship with other people. And so what God did was he created a pathway for us to get back in relationship with him. But we had to change. How many of you know God does not change? He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But what we have to do is repent and acknowledge where we went wrong, right? And then we are restored back to right fellowship with God. And so I want you to think about relationships in that context, right? So the best relationships we typically have with other people are relationships. Let's just say if I have a healthy relationship with God, the best relationships I have with other people are with other people who have healthy relationships with God. Can you all see that? And so a lot of times we're trying to fix relationships with people who don't have healthy relationships with God. And so the best thing we can do then is kind of pull back yep. and pray for them, not that our relationship get restored, but their relationship gets restored, right? Because once their relationship is restored, then our relationship can be restored because we're trying to have relationships with people and the terms of our communication don't agree. Babe, but what if... It's the spouse. Then he's stuck or she's stuck. But, but no, so, so if it's the spouse, then it's really the same principle, yeah. right? I, I can't fight with my spouse. I've got to be able to pull back, let them be who they are, and just pray for them. And love them. And love them through whatever it is that they're, they're going through and that they're dealing with. Does that make sense to everyone in the room? <laughs> All right, and so let's talk about some relationship wisdom, okay? So God gave us a pathway right through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. He gave all of us a pathway to get back in right relationship with him, right? So I want you to think about every broken relationship in your life should have a pathway to be restored back to you. We should never cut people off. I got three amens on that side. And I want you to think about this. What if God, what if God would have just cut you off and said, that's, I'm through with you. I'm tired of you. you Once not, I'm you. through, I'm through. Yeah, that's it. I'm die. Right? So, 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 so I'm setting that up this way because I'm trying to help everyone see before we get deep into it. Your relationships with people are going to reflect your relationship with God. Okay? So now let's keep going. Relationship wisdom tips. Assess those, number one, assess those in your inner circle. So you will only go as far as your inner circle, or you will go as your inner circle. And so the people you hang around are the people you become. Or stay. Right. And so assess those in your inner circle, and, and be okay with this. Sometimes we outgrow or grow in different directions with one another. And that's okay. Don't, don't penalize yourself if you've outgrown a previous relationship. That's okay. Just don't judge them. Just don't stop growing. You keep growing, right? But don't judge the individual that you may have outgrown. So, however, uh, we have what we call Christian friends. We have relatives. We have play cousins. How many of y'all have all of those in your life? Right? We, we have uh, a biblical way and a non-biblical way of striving with those that are in our inner circle, okay? Or those that are outside of our inner circle and then those that are inside of our inner circle. So we want to assess those in our inner circle. I mean, I know it's tough when I've been close to someone my whole life to acknowledge that, that we're not the same anymore. How I many of y'all will agree that's tough? And then the next toughest thing to do is to let go. Anybody ever been there, 
right? It's really tough, right? Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 11. And Paul gives us some, some insight here as to how to properly conduct ourselves with those outside of our inner circle and then those inside of our inner circle. He says, when I wrote to you before, I'm reading out of the New or the Living uh, Bible, the Living Bible. When I wrote to you before, I said to mix or to not mix with evil people. So Paul is really going back now to the church at Corinth, and he's re-explaining something he had said previously. And what he's saying here is, I wrote to you before to not mix with evil people. And so then he goes on to explain a little deeper what he actually meant by that statement. And he says, but when I said that I wasn't talking about unbelievers, so when I said that, I wasn't talking about unbelievers who live in sexual sin or are greedy cheats and thieves and idol worshipers. So, so how many know they need us? And so they'll never see a right way to do something if we remove ourselves from them. Can everyone see that? We should be and are to be lights in the world, right? And so we have to let our light shine so that it'll draw other people to God. But then he says, for you, don't, for you can't live in this world without being around people like that or with people like that. What I meant was that you are not to keep company with anyone, listen to this, who claims to be a brother Christian but indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or is a swindler or worship idols or a drunkard or abusive, don't even eat lunch. That's the Bible. That's not us. That's deep. Don't even. So, so if you understand what he's saying, sometimes Christians who say they're Christians don't live like Christians. And so you have to be careful, even in church, who you allow in that inner circle. Because sometimes Christians will do more damage than the world. When you're having a conversation with someone that you believe is another believer, but they're telling you, you're trying to live right, but they're telling you it doesn't take all that. They're, they're contradicting everything that's ministered across the Scripture. I, I know he said that, right? but God didn't mean that. God understands us. That's not what he told me. He knows what our needs are. He understands right? my heart. Yeah, he knows my heart. He made me this way. Why would he make me this way and not give me outlets to fulfill this? Right? And so what he's simply saying in here, even in your inner circle, make sure you are with like-minded people. And what I mean by like-minded, these are people who want to grow the way you want to grow and achieve at the level you want to achieve at, right? And so if you're a married couple, then run with other married couples that value the sanctity and, and, and covenant of marriage. You don't want your wife or husband, you know, close friends with someone that's, that's teeter-tottering on that, right? And so reinforcements, like-minded people in order for relationships to strive within that inner circle. You know, I love what 1 Corinthians 15 says. It says um, that bad company corrupts, that corrupts good habits. Yeah. You know, so that's all that needs to be said right there. So number two, sometimes distance is good. Sometimes distance is good. I'm clapping while I'm saying that so that you get it. Sometimes distance is good. There are plenty of people in our lives that we love, that we know, and we might even trust to a certain degree. Our parents, our siblings, an old friend, and the, the relationship might not be the, but these are people that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Right. You know that auntie that just always got something to say? <laughs> I love that commercial. It says, uh, she says, we just bought a new house, but we're, it's infected with ants. <laughs> and all five ants are in there. This is expired. This is expired. The other auntie doing this here stuff. But sometimes... The distance helps the relationship to be healthy. Yeah, yes, yes. You know, 
you still have a commandment. I don't care what happened in the past. Right. There has been some atrocious, horrific things that have happened in the past that might have, you know, if you're old school and you know the statistics, one in four women and girls have been molested or sexually abused. One in four. He just got through looking at a, a, one of those uh, crime things and one in four women have been abused. You still have a responsibility and a commandment to forgive. And sometimes these things have happened with family members. Someone that you just can't get rid of, right? You have to deal with them at the family gatherings. But you want to be at the family gathering. Sometimes distance is good to show up, establish your parameters, and keep it moving. Or sometimes, hey, I'll show up early before they get there, just have us show up at different times, right? You still have a commandment to forgive and to still love, check this out, to still love in spite of what history did. Mm -hmm. Because I don't care how bad it was, we still want to be loved in our messiness and nastiness when we don't deserve it. Right, right. Proverbs 15, 17 in the Passion says, it's much better to have a kind, loving family with little than to have great wealth with nothing but hatred and strife all around you. Wow. Proverbs 17, 1 in the easy-to-read version, I like this version. I'm starting to like this version a lot. It says, it is better to have nothing but a dry piece of bread to eat in peace than a whole house full of food and everyone arguing. <laughs> And so when you understand that, when God says in 1 Peter, one of my favorite scriptures, he says, finally, brethren, listen, this is what I want you to do. Not rendering evil for evil or riling for riling, but contrary wise, render a blessing so that you can inherit a blessing. Yeah. He goes on later to say, listen, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His, hear, his ears open to their prayers. Who is he that will harm you if you be doers of that which is, a, which is good? Before that, he says, pursue peace, ensue it. And he said, do whatever you can to pursue peace. Right. Not just peace around you, but peace within you. Yeah. And sometimes that peace within you says, you know what? We do better at a distance. Yeah. Mama, I'm going to call you, but our, 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 our conversation is limited to three to five minutes. <laughs> yeah. I hope you all caught that. Sometimes distance doesn't mean you don't love someone. Distance means you're giving space for each individual to work on themselves apart from each other so that we can come back at a different time in a different space in a healthier mindset to move forward with our relationship. I still can't believe it said that in the Bible. It says it. It said it's better. To have nothing but a dry piece of dry, not even a moist piece of No bread. butter. Minister Diane, no butter. N not even a croissant. It's, it's better to have a dry piece of bread in peace than to have a whole bunch. Whole house. Than full a of whole food. house full of arguing. But everybody's fighting. And see, the problem is oftentimes we think in our head to restore a relationship means to get it back to what it once was. Yeah, no. And it's not. No. Sometimes we have to grow in our fruit of the Spirit to endure the relationship. Because remember, love, one of the first things that he says love is, is long-suffering. Yeah. To... Long-suffering. Yeah. And right after that, he says patient. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we have to be able to develop in that fruit and learn wisdom that says, listen, we're better at a distance. Yeah. And maybe the relationship would never be restored to what it once was. Yeah. But it's in a new state. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's still a relationship. Though the other person might not like it, you might not like it. Yeah. But pursuing peace. Yeah. And godliness. Yeah. Makes it necessary. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about my first cousin, and I know my family watches, and my cousin, we talk, everything's good. It's my first cousin. But, you know, I remember, you know, when I gave my life to Christ, how I many you know sometimes your family doesn't respect that? And the only thing they know is who you were your whole life. And they will never credit you for being anything different or changing, right? 
And so he would keep coming over trying to force me back in too, right? And so it finally got to a place where, you know, we're both grown men now and you're at my house. And so I'll leave it at that, right? And so years went by. And he was like, cuz, how come we don't? I said, because I'm trying to stay out of jail, man, because you, you just won't let go of who I used to be, and you consistently want to drag me back into that, right? And so I don't know how many years it's been now, but, but now it's, it's a lot more cordial. It's healthy. And guess what? We're going on a cruise together this year. Now, before you start clapping... He'll be on his side of the boat do, doing his thing. Come on, somebody. And my wife and I, will be on the other side of the boat doing our thing. And we'll come together we'll for come, dinner. And we'll come together for dinner, right? And so I, I, I'm just trying to paint a picture that unless the terms are agreeable, it's very difficult for the relationship to be healthy. So sometimes you have to just accept what it is. And continue to pray for and, and, and trust God that he'll work with them, work on them so that we can get to a place in God where it can be back the way that it used to be. Now, Even with your kids, your grown kids, love them where they are. Both of mine are here. Love them where they are. But you continue to encourage them to where they need to be. Right, right. It's good. All right. Number three, relationships are messy. Anybody in one? How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Relationships are messy. You ain't that messy, though, baby. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, you're not either. I appreciate that. Yes, Lord. Thank yeah. you, Jesus. If I was, though, would you still be with me? We wouldn't have got married. We wouldn't have got married. So we wouldn't even have made it that far if I was far. messy no. on the front end. You'd have cut me off. All right. So relationships are messy. So you haven't really, listen to this, developed a good and healthy relationship until you've encountered disagreement. I would venture to say you don't even know what you have until you say no. No. We're not going. You can't buy that. Somebody was like, now nah, that, so, oh, I'm preaching now. My man up there in the audience, boy. He got like, up. He is on his feet. Boy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm helping him out right now. I'm helping him out, boy. He like, talk to her. Talk to her, pastor. Talk to her. We got a budget around here. And so I can see we ain't going to get through a whole lot of this. Because y'all going to just keep pulling on us, boy. Woo. And, and so we've learned that even in our relationship. You know, it, it, we, I'm hot. <laughs> let me just move on. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. Let's read that. Now, you all have the Amplified. Let me save some time. I'm going to read that out of the Passion Translation. Okay, relationships are messy. And you haven't developed a good and healthy relationship till you've encountered disagreement, what makes it healthy is that you can work through that disagreement and come out of it better. Yes. With a better understanding of each other, sometimes of what to do, what not to do, right? And then we on purpose say, I see that's a trigger for her. I'm not going to do that to her anymore and vice versa. Because, I mean, we can just pick on each other just to be picking on each other. All right, Proverbs chapter 14, I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation, verse 4. Listen to this. The only clean stable is an empty stable. So if you want the work of an ox and to enjoy an abundant harvest, you'll have a mess or two to clean up. So in the context of relationships, if you want everything clean, stay by yourself. Join the Himalayan monks up in the Himalayas. <laughs> because if you, if you want abundant harvest relationally, it's going to require work and cleaning up messes. More work, cleaning up messes to get to the abundant harvest. 
if you want a clean stable, stay by yourself. If you like everything the way you want it to be, where you want it to be, the way you want it done, stay by yourself. Because as soon as you insert someone else, they do everything differently. Babe, I'd like to add this, which is why some of you, though you want to get married, you're not yet married. Because you want everything your way. I'm not just talking about women. No, that's Men are the same way. You want what you want. And if you want what you want, get what you get. Which is being by yourself. That's all I got to say. I was trying to see. I just backed up. Where is she getting ready to go with that? And so, and so really, so, so then you've got to go along to get along. Mm -hmm. I got to give up a little bit of who I am in order to be what you need me to be. And vice versa. And you got to give up a little bit of who you are in order to be what I need you to be. Exactly. Right? And that, that's a word. That's called submitting to each other. Right? And so I'm adjusting who I am so that we can communicate and, and live effectively with each other. So if I on purpose do things, like, for example, if I don't make that bed up, you can clearly come in that room and say, he is disrespecting me. Right? Because that's important to her. If I leave clothes on the floor in the bathroom, see, I, that's intentional. I already know what that's going to do to her. Yeah, I can't wait till she walk in here and just see that right there. <laughs> how many of y'all know now I'm intentionally putting her in a position, right, that, that I shouldn't put her in if I already know on the front end she does not like those things. See, in our house, I know guys are getting ready to throw you off, but if you mess it up, you need to clean it up. And that's respectful in our house. My husband prophesied last night. Did I My prophesy? daughter is down here clapping, hollering. She's all over the place because he prophesied last night. I did the laundry, folded the clothes, put them in the laundry bags. I don't put away his clothes. He puts away his clothes. Cause but we're getting ready to fix that in front of all of these people. <laughs> no, we're not. It's yeah, fixed. Because if you're going to go through Minister all Johnny, of that, it's fixed, isn't it? Up. It's fixed. It's fixed. Go ahead. It works. 25 years, it works. <laughs> I folded the clothes, put his clothes in the laundry basket. It had been there for about a day or two. So finally, I picked up, picked up, because I did leave it on the floor uh, by the bed. I picked it up and put it on the bed on his side. That's my Yes, cue. That's Yesterday my cue. morning, before That's we came cue. to prayer, I said, babe, be sure to put away his clothes. Last night, he says, you know what? Before I do anything else, before I go to bed, he's looking at my daughter and me. Let me, because she's going to talk about it if I don't do it. Let me put these clothes away right now. Because if I don't get it done, she's going to talk about me in the morning. <laughs> I'm still talking about them, but it's a good thing because my baby knows, put them clothes away. Now, if you want a good night's sleep, fellas, <laughs> and maybe even some other things might happen. So you put them clothes away in faith. <laughs> Let's keep on moving. I'm sorry. And so, so finally then, there are times when we don't get to choose who we are in relationships with, right? We're talking about relationships are messy, right? So a lot of times we work with people, you know, live with neighbors, uh, relatives, coworkers, et cetera. We might have a boss. This does not give us permission to act like they don't exist in our lives, especially if we depend on them to get something done. Is everybody clear? So I can't just say I'm not going to deal with my boss. I have to learn how to deal with my boss in order to be effective on my job. I might not like the way they are. I might not agree with them. I might not see it the way they see it, but they are my boss. And I have to adjust myself to who they are in order to be productive on my job. Everybody clear on that, okay? And then last thing, learning and sharpening your skills on how uh, you relate to those around you is essential to not only your witness as a Christian, but also, listen to this, I love this, to your own personal peace. And, and yes. so why get into it with other people when I already know they don't like that? Why would I purposely do stuff? Right? Protect your own inner peace. 
Yes, that's right. So we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about the top four ingredients that make a healthy relationship. Mm. The top four. There's plenty. There's a whole lot. But the top four. Number one, effective communication. Number, that's, the, that's the root of all of it. Effective communication. If you got money issues, it's communication. If you got other issues, it's communication, right? There's very few things that's not a result of communication, right? Number two, conflict resolution. How do I resolve conflict amicably if possible? Number three, addressing expectations. Some of us have a problem saying what we mean and meaning what we say. If someone says, I'm sorry that I made you feel that way, and then we respond, oh, you're not sorry for what you did. You're sorry for my response. That might be the case. They might have meant what they said, but they might not have meant for it to hurt your feelings. So they could have reframed it. Right. But because we want what we want, we want to, we're trying to force them to acknowledge they're a wrong. So ex addressing expectations, because that's what you're upset about. You're upset that what they said or did hurt your feelings. So it's okay to say, I accept that apology, but let's talk about how we got here. Right. Right. And that's not healthy when we don't acknowledge what created the situation in the first place. We only acknowledge how one of the two responded to it. So we can acknowledge that, but I mean, we got to go back to understand how, we even, how this even started. And if we can't communicate effectively and, and resolve that conflict, we're probably not going to progress in this relationship. And then history is going to repeat itself because we thought just saying sorry solved it. It didn't because we never went back and communicated and resolved the conflict so that we could move forward. That's right. That's right. That's good. That's good. Number four. Amen. Number four, establishing and enforcing boundaries. Establishing and enforcing boundaries. Boundaries are necessary, even inside of marriages. Boundaries are necessary. When he's in his quiet time, the whole family knows, oh, daddy got that iPad out. Is he looking at sports, houses, or quiet time? And if we see James up there or something, he's in quiet time. Leave him alone. Same thing with me. I just go in a corner somewhere. You, they don't ever catch me usually. I don't, that's my boundary. Just hide. Disappear. Because she knows somebody's going to say, can you cook? Can, what are we eating? And she knows somebody getting ready to ask her to do something. So we're not going to get very far on today, uh, but I hope you're getting something out of it nevertheless. So let's, that was just the intro. That was just the intro. Now... Because we are aiming to get you out in this in 75 to 90 minutes. But I will start here. I will go on to say this. The foundation scripture is what this vision of this church is all about. Mm. It's an extension of the vision of this church. It comes out of the book of Colossae, Colossians. Mm -hmm. And it was a letter that Paul wrote to the church of Colossae. He never went to this church, but he had heard about their faithfulness. He had heard about their zeal. He had heard about their preaching and their teaching. He had heard about what they were trying to get accomplished, right? But they just got this because of the, the, the messengers. But the messengers didn't quite get the whole message all the way right with boldness and conviction. And so what was going on in the church of Colossae and why it was necessary for him to write them was because they just sprinkling a little bit of Jesus on their current lifestyles. <laughs> They were just saying, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to do what I want to do. In the name of Jesus, over my rituals and my practices. In the name of Jesus, over my speech and my conduct. In the name of Jesus, about some, just sprinkling a little bit of Jesus on their current lifestyle. They would cheat on their taxes and say, Lord, bless you. you know my heart. As we are in tax season right now. That's why I threw that one out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking over there at David like, uh-huh. <laughs> and so what Paul was saying, basically, since we did this tribute to Israel Houghton, he was saying, hold up, wait a minute. It's not like that. Because it's a new season. It's a new day. 
There's a fresh anointing. You know I want to sing. Coming my way. He was saying, wait, no. If you read the whole book of Colossians, Colossians he's saying, don't hate. See, you're going to have something else to say when I get a Grammy. But anyway. <laughs> he was saying, basically, you can't sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on what you're currently living. You have to be renewed. So he's talking all throughout the book of Colossians because you know, these people were established. These people were experienced affliction and, and persecution, but they were still established. These people dressed nice. They looked nice. They worked hard. They walked in. The, I mean, it was wealthy there. And he kept telling them to robe yourselves in new clothing. Clothe yourselves in Christ. And so he's telling them to take off the old clothing. Sorry. Take off the old clothing and put on Christ. And so that's what we're going to pick up with right here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 in the Passion. He says, you are always and dearly beloved by God. That's your number one relationship. Knowing and understanding and believing and walking in the truth that your God loves you more than you love yourself. So robe yourself with virtues of God. Since you have been divinely chosen to be holy, you are to be set apart. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can. Hatred cannot drive out hatred, only love can. So you are set apart to be holy, and to be holy is to be love and light. Amen. The salt of the earth. He says, be merciful as you endeavor to understand others. He said, you endeavor, not that you will, but you try. Right. And be compassionate, showing kindness towards all, towards all, towards all. Ooh, 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 all. So now you're a DJ. I'm a DJ. <laughs> Getting ready for the glow party. Be gentle and humble. Amen. Be gentle and humble. Control freaks have an issue being gentle and humble. You, your way ain't the best way. Your way not is not necessarily the only way. I'm ministering to myself right now. Check this out. Unoffendable in your patience with others. Tolerate the weakness of those in the family of faith. Forgiving one another in the same way you have been graciously forgiven by Christ. If you find fault with someone... Release this same gift of forgiveness to them, for love is supreme and must flow through each of these virtues. Love becomes the mark of true maturity. The foundation of every relationship is love. We already know there are several different categories of love according to the word of God, but the bottom line, agape love says, I am interested in your best interest, your best you, regardless of how you respond. That's good. That's the basic definition of agape love. I am concerned and invested in your best you, regardless of how you respond to me. When we can operate like that, then we've achieved, achieved not just a healthy relationship with those around us, but we are showing maturity in our healthy relationship with God because that's who he is towards us. That's good. So when we realize that every breath we take is a gift, and we cannot properly receive that gift until we exhale. Because a lot of us just want to keep taking. Right. Take your first breath. Now keep it. Don't exhale. Just take another breath. You're drowning in midair. <laughs> you have to give out carbon dioxide in order to give, get oxygen. Receive. Your carbon dioxide feeds those trees, those plants, that greenery. You're giving life to something that you need life from because they, God made this whole earth to cycle around giving and receiving, see time and harvest. That's good. So when you sow love, you realize you're sowing something that you yourself don't really deserve, but you have a revelation that I've deserved it, I've gotten it from the most high God. So therefore, who am I to reserve my love because of the way somebody else treated me. Love looks different, but at the end of the day, I am interested in your best you, 
regardless of how you respond to me. It might require distance. It might require a different status of relationship. But I am still vested in your best you. I'm not hating on you because you're succeeding. That's so good. That's so good. So if you think about that, that's excellent. So if you think about that in the context of, like, relationships, a lot of people can't move forward because they won't let go of what happened to them. Right? And so they can't love forward because this is unresolved back here. So still going to always go back to these same four principles here. I, I just want to survey the audience. How many of y'all have a situation with someone that you're in relationship with and you can't seem to get past something? Raise your hands. It's going to be everyone in the room. Raise your hand. Or most of the people in the room, right? Let me say it slowly, right? All of us do. I do. All of us do. Where, where Because it takes two people to be able to move past it, right? I'm talking about someone that you're in relationship with that is like we just we, we, no matter how far we try, we end up right back here. Anybody in here understand what I'm talking about? All right? And so, so, so really it's going to go back to this, right? Until we can go back and effectively communicate about that, right? And then resolve the conflict. How do we know the conflict is resolved? Because we begin to set and we address new expectations, so in other words, I did this, I responded this way. We have a healthy conf, uh, conversation around that. We resolve that conflict. Now we have to set new boundaries. So in order for us not to get here again, I need you to be this way. And then that person has to have the liberty to be able to say to you, and I need you to be this way and not respond this way or not do that or not say that or not, right? And then all of a sudden, we've got to establish and enforce new boundaries going forward. Then we've got to agree together that we're not going to do this to each other so that we can be healthy going forward. If that process does not take place, history will always repeat itself. That's right. That's right. It's a work in progress, it right? It is. But it requires you to change your thinking. Yeah. You can't sprinkle a little Jesus on the way you functioned yesterday in your relationships. Right. You have to change your thinking. It cannot be like the world. Right. It cannot be like the world because the world says, oh, I'm going to get you before you get me. Or better, worse yet, oh, you got me one time, you ain't going to do it again, so my wall is up. I'm just not going to deal with you. Right. And those people oftentimes are most miserable as a result. Because they're so busy building fences to keep people out, not realizing that they lock themselves in. Even in marriages, have those conversations. Tough conversations. If you are committed to, if you two are committed to one another, then you're committed to work through the changes necessary. It means constantly renewing your mind, constantly meditating on the scripture that keeps, it, 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 you can't just stop doing something and don't replace it with something else. Right. You can't do it. You have to constantly renew your mind to a different thinking. Say that she's, he, she, she's uh, not moving, but he's working on it. Then you are sowing into that relationship. Don't be afraid to sow because God will deal with them. That's right. If you're married to this person and there's nothing to go with divorcing about, but listen, it's just difficult. They're, they're stuck in their ways. She just won't change. She says she will, but she won't. Then, you, yes, there's boundaries, but it's not a wall. And now you get to sow into them. I love what Dr. Didi and Apostle Mike, they said the first seven years of their marriage was hell on earth. But God told her, treat him like the man you want him to be. Stop treating him like the man that he is. Treat him like the man you want him to be. It took some years, she said. I noticed no ladies, not one amen out there. I didn't hear nothing. All I heard was, ooh. Ooh, that's what I heard. Keep going. And then eventually, he came home. I mean, I, I love the way they tell it. He came, she, he came home and was fussing at her because he was setting up the argument. He was ready because he ain't want to be bothered. Football game on, he said he ain't want to be bothered that night. But he, here he come in with the attitude and everything, and she gives him a, give it a big old kiss, has dinner ready for him. He snaps at her, and she's like, well, I love you. And he keeps on with his attitude, and she just runs a bath for him. All this here stuff that he did not deserve. 
And after a while, he was like, well, hold, hold up. Wait, hold up. But what was the last thing she did? Because that one works every Oh, time. he was said, last thing she, he, he was like, I know, you know, I'm, I'm, the last thing was when they got in bed. And he that was like, work every as time. bad as I just treated her, I know ain't nothing happening tonight. And he said, but then she started backing that thing up. That one work every time right there, boy. Boy, you want a right reaction? Just move that thing in that direction, boy. I mean, you know, we're getting ready to get right fast then. Amen. <laughs> We're going to close right here. I mean, we got a whole set of notes. <laughs> But we're going to travel through this effectively, and we want to make sure you get it. It's almost impossible to squeeze this into three or four weeks. Um, the plan is to get this all done in five weeks, and we aim to do that. But nevertheless, the greatest relationship that we referred to was our relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as the music department makes their way on over, you know, I, I, I want to invite you to consider where you are in that relationship. Yeah. If you don't know the story, understand this. Humanity is born selfish. Humanity is born for pleasure. Humanity is brought into this earth wanting what it wants. Humanity is born since sin entered into the world with a sin nature from birth. And Jesus came so that we could have life renewed, free from fear, free from selfishness, free from bondage, free from the opinions and the approval of other people. He came so that we could live free, so we could live in love, and we could have eternity with him while enjoying the blessings of this natural life, striving for Christ's likeness. And if you're a person that has been tormented and that just don't know the power of living for Jesus, I want to invite you to have and indulge in this relationship with Jesus Christ. That's called Christianity. So while every heart is turned toward Jesus, every head is bowed. Have the people stand. Yes, yeah, stand up. And let's just seal this before, as we're doing this. So, Father, I just thank you for the power of your love that is the foundation of our existence. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. May the power of your word do what it is meant to do, set free, break yokes, destroy burdens. And as it does, Father, you're glorified and your kingdom is advanced in Jesus' name. So while every head is bowing, no one's moving and walking unless you're assigned to do so. If you have not received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, let's make that right today. Let's acknowledge that I can't get this done by myself. I've tried it my way and my way don't work. Every one step I take forward, I end up falling two steps back. Let's get with the one that's not into steps, but he's into leaps and bounds, abundantly above all you could ask or think. He makes it right. Or perhaps you were in relationship with God, but you've gotten out of fellowship. Some people call it being backslidden. We just call it being out of fellowship. But God says he's forever married to you. He ain't going nowhere. In fact, he says, that is very hard for you to be plucked out of my hand, but I will woo you back because I just love you that much. So if that's you, you know that you're not in right standing with God, but you want to get that right. You want to renew that relationship with Christ. You want Holy Spirit to be active. You want the evidence of, active, of answered prayer. We would love to pray with and for you there. Or perhaps you haven't planted yourself in a church. You've been wandering. There's a lot of good word out there. But you will never grow and flourish until you're planted somewhere. And if you believe Linked Up Church is the church that God is leading you to, you believe that you're called to allow Pastor Gregory and I to serve you and our entire staff, 
one thing I can promise you is that we will pray for you regularly, daily, and you will always receive the word of God. But we are here to serve the people that we're called to serve. If that's you, any of those three invitations are for you. Would you please lift your hand in the air so that we know that we are praying with and for you? I see those hands over there. I see that hand right there. I see this hand over here, this hand right here to my left, hand over here to my right. Praise God. I'm going to invite you to take a bold move because it takes you to do something you've never done before because he did something that, only no, that no one else has done before for you. Would you gather up all of your belongings, make your way out to the nearest aisle, and meet me right down here? And if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, listen, I invite you to come on down as well. So if you lifted your hand in the air, or you didn't, but you know you should have, would you please gather up your belongings? Come on down while we celebrate and applaud and rejoice right along with you. Hallelujah. Come on down now in the name of Jesus. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Come on down. Yes. Come on, y'all. Yes. I just want to come down and give each of you a hug. I'm a hugger. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you, big fella. Hey. Hey, sweetie. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. Praise God. Babe, you want to take it from here or you want me to do it? Close it out. Close it out. Okay. If you would, lift up your hand to the great high God. That's where your help comes from. And you're making this commitment and this pledge to him. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. In, the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I believe, I believe that, Jesus that Jesus is the Son of God. Is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he died for my sins. He rose after three days, he rose after three days and redeemed me from my sin. Redeemed me from my sin. I believe, I believe that he reigns right now. He's raised right now. At the right hand of God. At the right hand of God. Therefore, therefore, I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. Because I believe with my heart. Because I believe in my that Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Is Lord and Savior. And Savior. Jesus. Jesus. Come into my heart. Come into my heart. I receive you now. I receive you now. And I'm committed to it. And I'm committed to in it. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for those that have responded on this day. That their faith is sealed in you and that you show yourself strong on their behalf. As they are now in your hand, no man shall pluck them out. So, Father, though adversity and affliction may wait them, await them outside of these doors, I pray right now that you confirm yourselves, that you confirm yourself in them. Not only do we want a response, but we desire and seek com a conversion. And in that conversion, Father, they are on fire and zealous for you. We give you the glory, honor, and praise for what they're about to walk into in Jesus' name. Amen and so be it. Thank you so much for watching our online service. We certainly don't take that for granted. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to get connected with us, we encourage you to become a part of our online community. That's right. And you can do that by subscribing to our YouTube channel, sharing this video with a friend and following us on social media. Don't forget to meet us right here on this channel every Sunday for our services. If you desire to help us reach more people just like yourself and advance the kingdom of God, then click the Give button now. This will allow us to connect more people to God, their families, their purpose, and their communities. Thank you again for watching our service on today, and we'll, we'll see, see you next week. week.